Hello, I'm hematologist oncologist Dr. Tony Talibi. We're back with Dr. Mark Lipman, um, Chairman of Medicine University of Miami, and now we're going to discuss the treatment of locally advanced stage 1 to 3 estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. Okay. Let's assume a woman has had a biopsy of a breast mass which has come back positive for ER positive breast cancer and they've actually had a resection of the mass. What happens next for that patient? There are two aspects to her care fundamentally. One is management of the breast and one is the prevention of distant recurrence or metastatic disease. Most women are best managed locally with lumpectomy and radiation. They get to keep their breast. Mm -hmm. The treatment is very safe. Uh, there are women for whom, and it's very individualized, that may not be the best choice, but in general, more than 90% of women with smaller tumors can and should be managed that way uh, with absolutely, absolutely no decrement in survival. In fact, the survival may be a percent better. Um, depending on the size of the tumor, whether or not there are lymph nodes involved, other prognostic findings, the estrogen receptor, some form of systemic treatment, either drugs, chemotherapy, or hormones, <coughs> or both may well be indicated. and the single greatest advance in breast cancer by far is the certainty, certainty with which we know that giving those kinds of systemic treatments dramatically cures many women who would not otherwise be cured. Mm -hmm. And I use the word cure as it should be used. Their breast cancer is never coming back. Mm -hmm. I see. So first of all, let's discuss what is a sentinel lymph node biopsy? <clears throat> so a sentinel lymph node, breast cancer when it escapes from the breast, can be tracked, just like you could go to a forest and look for the trail of an animal. Mm -hmm. And uh, a sentinel node is a, a, the node to which the breast cancer, if it has spread, will go to first. Mm -hmm. So at the time of surgery, the surgeon can map or track which node is the sentinel node. It can be removed and examined in great detail. And if it is negative, the likelihood that there are other nodes that are positive is almost zero, less than 1%. And if it's positive, then in fact, uh, under certain circumstances, additional nodes should be looked at. I see. So let's just take the fake first scenario. Let's assume a woman or a man, their sentinel lymph node is negative. That means the breast cancer is still only in the breast. There is a test called the Oncotype DX. Is that something you recommend and what is that test? <clears throat> the Oncotype DX is a test of about 22 different genes, not just one gene like mm -hmm. the estrogen receptor. And it's been very well validated. It was actually developed by a student of mine, someone I trained. Mm. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat partial to it, mm. uh, Dr. Soon Peck, P-A-I-K. And it allows one to further define which women will benefit more from hormone treatment or chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. In certain settings, it's completely un an unnecessary expense. Mm -hmm. But on certain times, it can make all the difference in the world. And, and I think it's an individualized decision as to when it should be applied. I don't personally believe it should be used routinely. I see. So if, if the patient does have a high score, is that someone you would recommend chemotherapy for in the adjuvant setting or no? Absolutely, yes, other things being equal. Because the test not does two things. The thing it was designed to do originally was to say, well, what is the risk? Is this a high risk or a low risk? Mm -hmm. But what has turned out to be the case, which is really important, is that for women who have higher scores, not only is the bad news that they have an increased risk of recurrence, but the good news is that their cancer is particularly sensitive to chemotherapy, so that obviously they can receive chemotherapy and reduce their risk back to what it would have been with a lower risk cancer. I see. So let's take a different scenario. Let's say that the patient has had a positive central lymph nodes and multiple lymph nodes that are positive for cancer. What happens next with that patient? Do they, do they need CAT scans of their whole body to see whether the cancer is spread or no? Once again, this is a somewhat nuanced question and you asked it in two different formats. Mm -hmm. If a patient had one or two lymph nodes involved, most likely they are going to require chemotherapy, but there are many patients for whom endocrine therapy may be a better choice. Elderly, estrogen receptor positive women mm -hmm. will probably not benefit much from chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. For women who have really much more serious cancers with many lymph nodes involved, that is a setting in which I think being sure that there isn't metastatic disease by doing CAT scans and other kinds of imaging can make sense. Mm -hmm. For routine <coughs> breast cancer patients, 
who have stage one or two breast cancer, detailed imaging is not indicated. I see. So if your patients are receiving chemotherapy, can they work? Well, my experience is that about 95 to 98 percent of women who have had jobs uh, are able to continue right through chemotherapy. I think that the era that many people hear about chemotherapy is not the era that we are currently in. Mm -hmm. Most women do very well. I don't m mean in any sense to take away from the fact that it's a tough time and certainly different from not getting chemotherapy, but the era of people throwing up all the time and having to take to their beds is generally extremely unusual. Most breast cancer treatments are very well tolerated. I see. <clears throat> Actually, what do you do for uh, nausea, vomiting induced? So for one thing, we prevent it. We pre-medicate with a variety of drugs that, that, that sedate a bit, that are anti-emetic in quality. And these new drugs are very effective indeed, and we continue that for several days. But there are most of the drugs that are used to treat breast cancer really aren't the most poorly tolerated from that point of view. And I, I will tell you, in the last five years, the number of patients for whom emesis, vomiting, has really been a serious side effect, I, I almost can't remember. I almost can't remember. What happens to a woman's menstruation during chemotherapy? Well, assuming she's premenopausal and having her mm -hmm. periods, mm -hmm. um, the drugs, several of them, are very much um, toxic to the ovaries. And that's age dependent. Women who are under 35, about 15% will have their period stop. Women who are over 40, about 85% will have their period stop. Occasionally, after they stop, they come back when they're off therapy for reasons that are completely poorly understood. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And occasionally, for women who wish to preserve ovarian function because they would like to have children eventually, their ovaries can be put to sleep with hormones whilst they are being treated. And that is moderately effective, not completely so. Interesting. What are your recommendations in terms of sexual relations with a partner while receiving chemotherapy? There's no f quick answer to that. Breast cancer is a very important event in a family's life. Mm -hmm. And families that have happy and robust relationships, including sexual relationships, often survive patient those things and they mm -hmm. continue. There's nothing medically going on except that you might not feel perfect on a given day to prevent normal sexual functioning. Mm -hmm. But many times an illness, as I'm sure is obvious, can bring out in a family stresses and problems that were already present. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes an illness or its treatment can become more of an excuse rather than the actual cause. I see. Good centers, really terrific centers, like the one that we have here at the University of Miami, have excellent uh, supportive care. We have a Cortella Center that you know about in which all kinds of psychotherapy, sex therapy, visualization, imaging, yoga, massage, all kinds of things that can help a woman or a man uh, to preserve and improve their quality of life are available. And I think that's critical in, in any treatment uh, program to have all of those resources available. I see. So let's let's now assume that the patient has finished their chemotherapy. <clears throat> what do you would you what would you recommend next? Would you recommend hormonal therapy for some years after that? For those patients whose tumors are estrogen receptor positive, almost invariably, endocrine therapy for at least five years is indicated. Mm -hmm. Though chemotherapy is a big deal and taking a pill once a day seems like a much lesser deal for many women women the pill, once a day, is more valuable in terms of preventing their recurrence mm -hmm. than all the chemotherapy. Mm. I see. So what is tamoxifen? Tamoxifen commonly is called an anti-estrogen. It, mm -hmm. It's not quite that, but it's a drug that interferes with the ability of estrogens in a woman's body to act normally. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And a breast cancer that is responsive to estrogens will regress and go away when treated with tamoxifen. That, that's actually the thing uh, we discussed earlier. Is that I was the first person to show that you could do that to breast cancer. Yeah, that's amazing, yes. What are some of the side effects? So everybody worries about side effects. And the, the first thing I would say, and I think it's very reassuring to women, is that in large randomized studies in which a couple of thousand women got tamoxifen and a couple of thousand didn't, the women taking the placebo in those studies could not correctly identify whether they were on tamoxifen or the placebo. Mm -hmm. Most women 
do not have side effects. Mm -hmm. Naturally, if you take a pill and something happens, you attribute it to the pill. If I took a pill every day and I had a migraine, I'd say, well, the pill caused it. Right, right. But you see migraines in everybody. Right. So that being said, there are some side effects. Tamoxifen can certainly be associated with a small risk of blood clots, about the same as being on oral contraceptives. Some women certainly will have hot flashes and that are worse, but they usually go away. Mm -hmm. There is a tiny risk, one in 150 women who take tamoxifen for five years, mm -hmm. if they have a uterus, can get a very benign form of uterine cancer, mm -hmm. and that's worrisome, but correct screening and follow-up removes any chance of lethality from that. I see. What about this other class of medicines called the aromatase inhibitors? What are those? <clears throat> so a woman's body makes estrogens in the ovary, and when she's older, hormones that will be turned into estrogens are made in the adrenal glands. Mm -hmm. The enzyme that converts these pre-hormones to estrogens is called aromatase. And there are three drugs approved for breast cancer called aromatase <coughs> inhibitors, mm -hmm. which block the production of estrogen. They are popular, but in fact, it is well worth pointing out that there has, is yet to be a survival advantage mm -hmm. for taking an aromatase inhibitor over tamoxifen. So while they are effective and are slightly better in terms of preventing recurrences, uh, whether or not one takes tamoxifen first and potentially an aromatase inhibitor later probably doesn't make any difference at all. I see. So what are some common side effects you see with the aromatase inhibitors? Only one. They're very safe drugs indeed, mm -hmm. but that one can be very un un unfortunate. Uh, at least 25 or 30 percent of women will develop a, a, a diffuse system of bone aches and stiffness, like they have a cold or myalgias. Usually it goes away, usually it's mild, but in my experience, at least 5% of women have to stop the drug. They just don't like it. It won't hurt them. In other words, the bones aren't damaged. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there's just no quality of life, so you can't stay on it. So I have trouble dealing with that as a young oncologist. Please tell me, how would you manage that? If someone presented to you with bone pain or joint pain, how much time do you give them before you switch them or stop the drug? It depends a little <laughs> bit on the woman. There are women who are very... They say, I want every ounce of prevention I can get, and I, I'll deal with this, and I'm fine. Mm -hmm. So I say, okay, that's good. <laughs> mm -hmm. There are women who say, I'm not so fine. Um, there are two, at least two options whilst staying on aromatase inhibitors. One is you can try a different one. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there is less side effects when you switch to a different one. There are three, mm -hmm. as we mentioned. The second thing is there are some data. It's controversial, but the, the, it's so safe that I do it all the time and that is to uh, administer reasonably large doses of vitamin D. Mm. Two to 3,000 units of vitamin D3 in several studies have been shown to ameliorate some of these side effects, and some studies not, but it's so safe that I, I, I don't hesitate to try it. That's IV or pills? Oh no, pills, one pill a day, it's very one easy. One pill a day? Yeah, vitamin D3. I didn't know that, that's interesting. <clears throat> now, so, so I can't get you to commit to whether you'll pick tamoxifen or an aromatase inhibitor for five years. Do you have a preference? Does it? Well, so there are studies that suggest that five years of tamoxifen followed by five years of an aromatase inhibitor may be actually optimal. Um, it is <coughs> common in this country for postmenopausal women to begin them if they're going to get a hormone therapy on an aromatase inhibitor. We should recall that premenopausal women with functioning ovaries cannot be treated with aromatase inhibitors. So in those patients, right. they're always getting tamoxifen. Right, right, right. There's new data that perhaps <clears throat> the bisphosphonates, the bone-protecting agents, might actually reduce the risk of recurrence of breast cancer. What, do you, what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? I think that the data, so almost any study can have some controversial parts to it, but the most recent information is, I think, compelling. And I believe that every patient diagnosed with breast cancer, unless they have a contraindication, should either be on a bisphosphonate or a rank ligand uh, inhibitor. I see. Interesting. Okay. So what do you tell your patients regarding the odds of cure of either lymph node positive or lymph node negative ER positive breast cancer? Um, that's not enough information. I'd really want to know a lot more so that I could be far more, as you know perfectly well, but mm -hmm. people watching this may not, having a single lymph node involved is a very different kettle of fish from having mm -hmm. 10 lymph nodes involved. <clears throat> so I'd want to know a good deal more before I prognose. And also I think that those kinds of discussions aren't, well, here's a piece of paper, this is your risk of relapse. Mm -hmm. I mean, that needs to be done in a fashion 
that's respectful of the woman and her family, by which I do not mean lying to a patient, mm -hmm. but providing information in ways that she can deal with, incorporate, and take advantage of. Mm -hmm. I mean, try it this way. If I told you you have a 63% chance of dying of something, or a 44% chance of dying of something, mm -hmm. and there's no, no further treatment right. for you, what right. good does that do you? Right. Exactly. What good does that do you? So I, it's not that I withhold information, but I try to provide it in a context. There are women who will come to see me. They've got a pad. They've got a camera just like this, and they're writing it all down. And they want every last fact, and they're welcome to every last fact. There are women who say, I know enough. I'm going to follow your treatments. <coughs> and I'm respectful of that. If anything has characterized how my personal care uh, is different as it, than from when I was your age, it's that I... <coughs> which isn't to say you might not do it my way, is that I really do much more, not just tailor make my drug therapy, mm -hmm. but tailor make my emotional response to what I really think is what the patient is truly asking me for. Mm, that's fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you for watching. We hope this has been educational for you as well.